supporter and I'm a journalist and I'm the board of the Atlanta Press Club. And I introduced Dennis Lockhart, the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, as he spoke to us as part of our newsmaker series. We would like to thank our program sponsors for today's event, SunTrust Bank and Wells Fargo, and I would also like to recognize Kennesaw State University, our presenting sponsor, and introduce Dr. Daniel Papp, who is the president of Kennesaw State University. Daniel Papp's had um, such a wonderful career in Georgia and in the academic circles. I'm not going to say how far back we go, but just know it's decades. So, <laughs> Daniel, you can come up. Decades already, Brian? Uh, <laughs> Multiple. <laughs> On behalf of Kennesaw State University, it's a pleasure to serve as the presenting sponsor uh, for this afternoon's Atlanta Press Club Newsmakers Luncheon. It is especially an honor to be here with our good friend Dennis, Dennis Lockhart, uh, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Uh, Mr. Lockhart's expertise is something that is uh, we here in the American South benefit from tremendously, and across the nation, uh, the country benefits from it as well. Just a few words about Kennesaw State University. Next Monday, we will welcome our 33,000 students to begin fall semester. Uh, we were founded about 50, 51 years ago. Uh, we had 1,044 students there. We have almost twice as many faculty members now as we had students then. Uh, over the course of the last year and a half or so, uh, one of the highlights at Kennesaw State and at our neighboring uh, institution, the former Southern Polytechnic State University, uh, was the consolidation of the two institutions. So now with Southern Poly and Kennesaw State consolidated into one single 33,000 student institution, we truly have a powerhouse. Uh, last week, we with our the graduation of our 100,000th student, uh, we are entering the realms truly of large national universities. We are now one of the 50 largest public universities uh, in the country. And lest I forget, in about 24 hours, uh, 24 days and seven and a half hours, uh, the Kennesaw State University football team will take the field for the first time ever uh, against Eastern Tennessee up in Johnson City, Tennessee. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta serves the 6th Federal Reserve District, which includes Atlanta, Florida, Georgia, and parts of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Now, that only tells us one slice of Dennis Lockhart. Um, he actually, this is his second tenure in Atlanta. From 1978 to 1986, he was a senior corporate officer for the Southeast Office of Citibank. And when he was in that role, he was instrumental in the founding of the Atlanta International School. That is something he is still involved with today. Um, and I used to cover international business during that period, and I remember seeing him being one of those real, um, in those days, it was kind of rare to have a banker in Atlanta really understand the global markets. Um, he serves on the director of the Metro Atlanta, as a director of the Metro Atlanta Chamber, as on the Commerce Club Board, trustee of Agnes Scott College, the Atlanta International School, the Georgia Research Alliance. Hey guys, they, they wanted to be sure that I mentioned them. And, uh, and the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University. Also been involved with the World Affairs Council. And let me just tell y'all, you know, I have gotten to know a side of Dennis Lockhart because he married a good friend, Mary Rose Taylor. And the guy is good to the core. So let help me introduce and help me welcome Dennis Lockhart to the podium. Dennis Lockhart is a very influential member of the Federal Reserve Bank system. The Wall Street Journal had a piece about him just last Wednesday talking about how he is probably one of the best indicators of what might happen to U.S. monetary policy. And what he spoke to us about today is 
the possibility and maybe even the likelihood that there's going to be some rise in interest rates in the near future. This was an opportunity for the press to ask him questions uh, ranging on all sorts of issues and also for the general public uh, who comes to our meetings to ask him questions. Take a look at uh, not just oil but things like copper uh, and uh, kind of measures that the global economy may be slowing. To the extent that the decline in commodity prices is some kind of a signal of a materially slowing global context. As he said during his talk, he's good at dancing around certain questions because the Federal Reserve Bank has to be very careful in everything that it, that it says. And he actually said that he was speaking for himself personally. Uh, but he talked about how much improvement the economy has had since 2008 when it bottomed out uh, and uh, how it's now come back to pre-recession uh, levels of strength. Well, Maria, thank you so much for that introduction. And how do I say this in that this group? Don't believe everything you read in the press. <laughs> that doesn't sound quite right in this, in this group. Um, I very much appreciate the chance to, to be here at the Atlanta Press Club. Um, as members of the Fourth Estate, and I know there are lots of guests here in the room, you certainly understand the qualities of a good story. The daily news story, I'm told, is uh, mostly follows the format of who, what, where, when, and why. Longer stories, both nonfiction and fiction, make the greatest impact uh, when there is a, her a hero or heroine, when there's a conflict that builds dramatically and with suspense to a climax, and when the highest point of drama is followed by resolution. The French have a great word for that part of the story. It's denouement. So my high school French finally comes, <laughs> comes into use. Well, today I want to begin my remarks by telling the story of the U.S. economy over recent years. Uh, we might think of the economy itself as the hero. The recovery from deep recession is the struggle. The impending decision to begin raise, raising interest rates is the climax. And the normalization of monetary policy, along with the further normalization of our economy, is the denouement. If all that seems a tad contrived uh, for this venue and this audience, I ask you to indulge me. To put all this in a more conventional framework, one that you might expect from a central banker, the story I'll tell is one of how far we've come, economically speaking. Specifically, I'll discuss how far we've come in terms of employment, and labor market health. I'll tell the curious story of inflation, a story of less progress. And I'll present my personal forecast of uh, how the story will play out for the next couple of years after the point of liftoff. Liftoff is the term used to describe the first decision to raise interest rates. As always, you will be hearing my personal views. I don't speak for the Federal Reserve or the Federal Open Market Committee. In this talk, I'll refer to the Federal Open Market Committee as the FOMC or the committee. This must be emphasized given the current context of intense interest in what, when, and why the FOMC will decide to do something with interest rates or not. So I'm speaking only for myself. The story could begin in the summer of 2009, when the economy emerged from the Great Recession and a long recovery began. However, I prefer to begin the story in December of 2008, when the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, completed a rapid year-long downward march of its policy rate, the federal funds rate. The federal funds rate, the overnight rate for bank-to-bank -bank lending, 
is the Fed's cheap policy rate. Where this rate is set affects other borrowing rates broadly across the economy. The downward march of the policy rate began in September 2007 when the committee dropped the federal funds rate from five and a quarter percent to four and three quarters percent. Interestingly, I joined the Fed in March of 2007, and when I joined, the federal funds rate was at five and a quarter. Quickly went to zero. As the crisis unfolded, the FOMC pushed the rate lower, and it reached zero effectively in December of 2008. It's been there ever since. The economic conditions that evoked the, uh, that policy response in 2008 were extraordinary. Let me describe the situation of the national economy at that time. When the Fed's policy rate hit zero in December of 2008, the official rate of unemployment had already climbed from a low of 4.4% to 7.3% and was rising rapidly. It would peak at 10% in less than a year. Between 2007, December of 2007, and February 2010, U.S. payrolls fell by more than 8.7 million workers. In the fourth quarter of 2008, Real gross domestic product contracted at an, that is shrunk, at an annualized rate of 8.2%. The economy's performance in that quarter was its worst in 50 years. In December 2008, the economy had already been in recession for a year. The recession wouldn't officially end until the following June. When it finally did end, the cumulative loss in national output amounted to the greatest contraction in economic activity in post-World War II, in the post-World War II era. The recession was extraordinarily deep, and it was broad. In early 2009, a substantial majority of U.S. industries had either stopped hiring or were cutting their, their workforce. Construction activity, very relevant here in Atlanta. Construction activity and employment entered their deepest and most protracted decline since World War II. Industrial production was hard hit as well. In January 2009, for instance, Four of five manufacturers and other industrial producers were generating output at levels below six months earlier. Retail spending was off more than 10% from year earlier levels. And measures of consumer confidence had fallen to near historic lows. Virtually every region of the nation and every economic sector at that time were under substantial stress. Let me contrast this picture of the state of our economy at the end of 2008 and early 2009 with the picture we see today. Since bottoming out in the second quarter of 2009, real economic output is up cumulatively about 13%. Said differently, the economy is 8.5% larger than its pre-recession peak. To give a sense of the scale of improvement, the U.S. economy has added activity about equal to the economy of Mexico. Although the pace of improvement in output has been slower than hoped for, by most measures, real gross domestic product is approaching its full current potential. From its peak of 10%, the rate of unemployment has fallen to 5.3%. We received a new employment situation report just last Friday. The official unemployment rate 
remains at 5.3%. This level of unemployment is just a shade above what some economists think is consistent with full employment. A broader measure of unemployment and underemployment, one that includes marginally attached workers and those working part-time and voluntarily, it too continued to fall in June to 2.4 to 10.4 percent. From the employment trough, the economy has added more than 12 million jobs. Consumer spending, which really does uh, motivate or drive the economy in many ways, is almost 14 percent above its recessionary bottom. And consumer confidence has recently climbed back to near and by some measures above pre-crisis levels. So to sum up, the, co the economy has come a long way in the more than six and a half years since the federal funds rate hit bottom. A subtext, however, is that the recovery has been slow. It's taken more than six years of recovery to accomplish what I just described. Clearly, this is a rather long story. The recovery has proceeded at an average annual pace of expansion of only 2.1% per annum. Over this period, the economy has faced a number of headwinds and shocks. We've pushed through several domestic fiscal showdowns, including one federal government shutdown, two major winter weather events, geopolitical tensions, and wide swings of global energy prices. Most recently, the Greek and European Union stare down was unsettling with its potential for a major financial event or worse. These developments slowed activity, shook confidence, and bred cautious economic, economic behavior on the, part, on the part of American consumers and businesses. These spells of cautious behavior have contributed to a slow pace of recovery. The expansion over these six years has been sustained by extraordinary policy medicine involving not only ultra-low interest rates, but also three episodes of quantitative easing, or QE. To explain quantitative easing, much in the press in the earlier years, essentially the Federal Reserve creates new money and uses it to buy long-term securities and that buying power puts pressure on long-term interest rates, affecting mortgage rates, car loan rates, and so forth. The Fed undertook these large-scale asset purchases, as we call them, to exert even more downward pressure on interest rates. QE3, I love to talk about QE2, because then you could talk about some ship that goes to England. <laughs> QE3 ended last December in recognition of substantial improvement in the state of the economy. One constant over this period has been the FOMC's focused attention on achievement of our Congress-mandated policy objectives. True North in the committee's setting of monetary policy is maximum employment and low and stable inflation. In January 2012, the FOMC took the step of defining a formal target, uh, target rate of inflation. The committee set the inflation target at an annual rate of 2% to be achieved over the longer run. The committee believes this rate is an, of inflation is most compatible with healthy growth, healthy conditions in the economy, and an adequate cushion against disinflation and eventual deflation. There are many inflation statistics. The committee chose to apply the headline or total rate of inflation according to the index of personal consumption expenditures 
This is an index calculated by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. The curious thing in this story is that over six years of expansion, inflation has chronically remained well below this target of 2%. The average rate of inflation over the six plus years of recovery has been 1.5%. Some of this weak price pressure can be explained by temporary influences such as falling oil prices playing through to gasoline prices and other products and the appreciating dollars impact on import prices. Oil prices, for instance, have fallen by about 50% since last summer and have fallen another 12% in the past month alone. These downward pressures on the rate of inflation are not yet entirely behind us. Because of such factors, it has been difficult to discern the true underlying rate of inflation and its trend. This analytical challenge continues, and I expect it to persist for a while. But even if we heavily discount the influence of transitory forces on the headline inflation trend, inflation has remained low relative to our objective. A few months ago, anticipating an eventual change of policy, the committee set out two qualitative criteria for an initial interest rate increase. We said we want to see further improvement in labor market conditions. And we want to be reasonably confident that the inflation rate will rise over the medium term to 2%. The committee also repeatedly emphasized that the decision will be data dependent. This means there is no foreordained date, and the incoming numbers will dictate the timing of the decision. When the committee is comfortable that these two tests have been met, the policy move will come. My colleagues and I always uh, intensely monitor economic data, and that has been especially the case over recent months. Progress since the first of the year has been quite encouraging. As re regards labor market conditions, almost one and a half million more jobs have been added to U.S. payrolls since last December. And the national unemployment rate has fallen by half a percentage point in the past eight months. After a weak first quarter in 2015, during which the economy barely grew, the economy bounced back to some extent in the second quarter to record a solid rate of growth in excess of 2%. Key to my own thinking on impending policy decisions is the outlook from here. I expect somewhat stronger growth in the second half of the year. I expect the employment markets to continue to tighten. I expect continuing labor market progress to begin to put upward pressure on wages across the economy. And I expect convincing evidence to emerge that inflation is rising to a safer level and approaching our 2% target. The economy has made great gains and is approaching an acceptable normal. Policy should acknowledge this reality. The Fed took extraordinary policy measures in response to extraordinary economic conditions. Conditions are no longer extraordinary. Compared to earlier this year, we know a lot more and can shelve some concerns. We appear to be past the most acute concerns of a spillover from Europe. I have more confidence in the resilience of the economy today compared to even a few months ago. I am much less concerned about a reversal of economic fortune. We are getting closer and closer to what feels like a healed state of the economy. 
For me, the cumulative evidence of the economy's healing and the likelihood that the economy is on a path to achieving the Fed's mandated objectives makes me comfortable that the economy can handle a gradually rising interest rate environment. Fed Chair Janet Yellen has stated she expects conditions to gel, justifying a start to policy normalization sometime later this year. I agree. I think the point of liftoff is close. As the committee approaches what I consider a historic decision, I am not expecting the data signals to point uniformly in the same improving or upward direction. I don't need this. I'm prepared to see mixed data. Data are inherently noisy month to month and quarter to quarter. Given the progress made over the recovery and the overall recent tone of the economy, I for one do not intend to let the gyrating needle of monthly data be the decisive factor in decision making. This is not to say that the process of policy normalization should be implemented with urgency requiring a rapid pace of rate increases. Indeed, there are reasons to approach normalization with patience and a deliberate pace. While the economy is a considerable distance from where it was when our zero, rate, zero interest rate policy was put in place, we have somewhat further to go. The committee has provided guidance that the, pot, the path of interest rate increases will likely be gradual. I expect such a stance of policy to be appropriate for some time after liftoff. This is perhaps the most important message to reinforce today. A private sector economist whose commentary I follow has typecast monetary policy options as aggressively stimulative, stimulative, neutral, restrictive, and aggressively restrictive. I think this is a useful framework. In those terms, policy will likely transition from aggressively stimulative toward merely stimulative. So let me recap my main points. <clears throat> Much progress has been achieved since December 2008 when the Fed's policy rate reached zero and mid-2009 when the recession ended. That progress has been accomplished with the support of extraordinary monetary policy. Current and prospective economic conditions increasingly do not demand the most aggressive stance of policy. I think the time to begin normalizing monetary conditions is <coughs> close. Once underway, the process of raising interest rates to more normal, sustainable levels will likely be gradual. This has been a long story, sometimes frustratingly so, but I, but, I, but I am one who is increasingly confident that it will have a happy ending. And with that, I will, in the great tradition of central bankers, hear your questions and do my very best to give you obscure answers <laughs> <laughs> or invade the question all <laughs>
first let me start by explaining that the Federal Reserve is apolitical, <laughs> nonpartisan. Uh, we have the privilege of formulating monetary policy with independence, although we report to Congress. And uh, in order to preserve that independence, we don't wade into obviously political questions. But the last part of your question, I can probably make some comment on. And the last part of your question is uh, what influence will the state of the economy have on the politics of 2016? And there have been a lot of studies of this. And the studies show that the condition of the economy and the prospects for the economy have a big influence on how people vote. Uh, so uh, for better or for worse, I'm not going to take sides, the situation that the candidates will face, as I have predicted, will be a moderately improving economy with positive, uh, positive prospects ahead. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll just uh, comment on the possibility that the Fed's policies have contributed to the anemic recovery because banks are reluctant to lend at long term at what they perceive to be artificially low rates, and savers have cut back on spending because their income stream from interest has dried up. Well, I, I, Did everybody hear the question? Did you want I'll to? repeat the question. Okay. Um, the question is, would I attribute uh, Fed policy to the, or the anemic recovery to Fed policy, uh, first relating to bank lending, the fact that bank, and this might be something other than the interest rate policy, is the dot implementation of the Dodd Frank Act, which might be something you were thinking about. Um, does that have, has that had an effect or had an influence on the recovery? And then the second part of the question was, would I add to that interest rate policy that has uh, certainly not rewarded savers uh, and people on fixed incomes and so forth because of low levels of earnings on the, on their deposits and uh, other investments. Is that a fair summary of the question? Yes, sir. Well, let me just give you what I think are the facts. Uh, the attribution can be argued uh, in, in different ways. Uh, following the recession, with the implementation of the Dodd-Frank Act, there is no question that banks' credit standards were far more stringent than they were prior to the financial crisis of 2008 and the recessionary period in 2008 through mid-2009. And therefore, it was harder to get a loan. And this certainly affected some borrowers in the economy. Uh, we implemented the Dodd-Frank Act. We made many of the rules, but we implemented the Dodd-Frank Act um, as our responsibility as something that had been passed into law. I would also say, however, that some of the losses and bank failures and stress that the banking system was under during that period also influenced credit standards. So I, I don't think you can attribute everything to policy, the conditions changed, and banks uh, responded to those much more stressful conditions. On the second part of the question, um, I often get this question or sometimes very strongly put comment that you're killing me with low interest rates, you know, I depend on my CDs for an income or I depend on a portfolio of bonds that are paying very little uh, for income, uh, particularly affects retired people who, uh, whose incomes depend on, on those sources. The, the key point is monetary policy uh, sets rel relatively uniform conditions through interest rates uh, around the country. We cannot target it on one group, so we can't reward one group for their good behavior and saving by giving them high interest rates through market through market um, methods or market channels, and at the same time have a low interest rate for borrowers. So uh, I can say we felt, I felt that 
the best response to the very weak economic conditions that we saw during that period was to lower the interest rate. Some people gain from that, some people feel that stress. But we can only have one interest rate policy. 